Tonight on KGW News, Portland businesses at a breaking point. I never thought it would get to this. It's killing me. I'm scared for the lives of my employees. We ask police why they're not doing more to stop the steady stream of vandalism and theft. Plus, how was someone able to steal more than a million dollars from the city of Portland and no one noticed for weeks? And later, the full Rose Festival returns for the first time in two years. Your news starts now. And we'll have those stories in just a moment. But first tonight, police in Texas admit they made serious and likely deadly mistakes in the minutes after a gunman made his way into an elementary school and started shooting. Thank, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm David Molko. Families tonight outraged to learn nearly 80 minutes passed between the time the shooter entered and the time he was shot dead. And during a news conference today, the director of Texas Department of Public Safety clarified that timeline and said the first 911 call was made at 1130 in the morning Tuesday after the gunman crashed his truck outside the school and shot at a nearby funeral home. Now, three minutes after the call, the gunman was in the classroom where he opened fire. 1203, there were 19 officers in the halls of the school, but they didn't enter the classroom for another 47 minutes. The on-scene commander at the time believed that it had transitioned from an active shooter to a barricaded subject. For the benefit of hindsight, where I'm sitting now, that of course it was not the right decision, it was the wrong decision. And as the investigation builds, so does the grief. The grandmother of a 10 year old victim named Eliana Torres pleading for answers. You know, how did he get in there? Why weren't the, the school doors locked with chains? You know, or, or why weren't even the, the classroom doors were, were locked? Why? So many questions and rightly so. Investigators now say the 18 year old gunman got into the school through a propped open door. And here are just some of the ways you can help families who've lost loved ones. University Health based in San Antonio has set up a relief fund for victims. Another group Victims First has a GoFundMe. More than $3 million in donations collected for things like funeral expenses and counseling. Many more details at KGW.com. Well, Oregon Senator Ron Wyden joining the growing list of parents and some political leaders calling for answers, accountability and action when it comes to gun legislation. Now, Senator Wyden proposing things like universal background checks, raising the age limit to buy guns and banning assault weapons, none of which he says will infringe on the rights of law abiding gun owners. The senator asking to find common ground using what he calls common sense. I refuse to lose hope that this groundswell and this tremendous grassroots anguish over these atrocities, I just refuse to believe that that anguish is going to lose strength. And Senator Wyden said he is making gun laws a major part of the discussion in the coming days as he hosts virtual town halls across Oregon. Also tonight, the 18 year old driver police say ran a red light with a car full of high school students now faces multiple charges, including manslaughter. The crash in Beaverton in April claimed the lives of two teenagers in his vehicle and severely injured four others, including a sheriff's deputy. Let's bring in Alma McCarty, who was in the courtroom as Xavier Rodriguez made his first appearance. Alma and David, just a devastating case with so many people involved today. Rodriguez was released from the hospital where he'd been staying for a month into the custody of Beaverton police. This afternoon, he pleaded not guilty. In Washington County, 18 year old Xavier Rodriguez went before a judge for the first time in a cell side arraignment. The judge said the suspect in the deadly car wreck that killed two teens and injured several others was not mobile enough to be brought into the courtroom following his Friday arrest. Rodriguez pleaded not guilty to all 12 charges handed down in an indictment by a grand jury. He faces four counts of manslaughter and six counts of assault, in addition to DUII and reckless driving charges. One month ago, investigators say Rodriguez driving a Nissan Altima with four other Southridge High School teens inside 
ran a red light and crashed into Washington County Deputy Michael Trotter. Two students, Matthew Amaya and Juan Pacheco Aguilera, were killed. The three others in the car were taken to the hospital, as was Deputy Trotter, with serious injuries. And last week, we got an update on Deputy Trotter, learning he's stable and off his respirator, communicating with family and hospital staff, but he has a long recovery ahead of him. And David. we're certainly pulling for him. Alma, thank you. A 15 year old has been arrested for the most recent homicide in our area. He's accused of killing 23 year old Antoine Archer in Gresham. Archer was found dead from a gunshot wound Wednesday in the parking lot of the East Park Place apartment complex. No word yet on a motive. This is the eighth homicide in Gresham this year. All of them have been gun related. Well, the city of Portland is investigating a cyber attack, one that led to more than a million dollars being stolen from city funds. A spokesperson with the Office of Management and Finance said $1.4 million of city funds were stolen in late April, but the breach wasn't actually discovered until May 17th after a second attempt to steal funds. The attackers somehow got access to a city email account in order to make the illegal transaction. The FBI, U.S. Secret Service, Portland Police, they are all involved. And the city says it is doing an internal investigation. All right, it's supposed to be the unofficial start of summer. Instead, a super soaker. Joe, Joe Ranieri is here. Joe, I hope we are not talking about a weekend washout here. No, we are seeing a, a soaker for Saturday with some showers heading into Sunday and things will gradually improve uh, once we get into Memorial Day. But as we look at the radar right now, yeah, we've been picking up some showers earlier this evening, but we're going to be seeing some dry conditions the rest of your Friday night and then we'll start to see some showers really move through by the later part of the morning and into the afternoon. Just expect to see uh, a good amount of showers from beginning to end heading into the first part of the holiday weekend. If you'll be traveling over the mountain passes, you are going to be seeing some snow showers late tomorrow night and into Sunday. We do have some watches and mornings we'll get to in a little bit, but uh, this is the amount of rain we've seen so far. Just over a tenth of an inch of rain in Portland. Most of that coming late this afternoon and in the early part of the evening when a lot of people were at City Fair kind of enjoying some of those rides, right? Well, a very wet holiday weekend ahead as we look at the weather headlines. Heaviest rainfall arrives by the later part of the morning and into the afternoon. There's also a slight chance to see some thunderstorms develop. A better chance to see those thunderstorms roll through will be throughout the central and eastern side of the state. Again, heavy mountain snow late tomorrow night. So if you're planning on some camping trips here the next couple of days, be prepared for some big changes. This Memorial Day weekend is not going to look anything like it did last year when we saw temperatures in the mid to the upper 80s. Right now we're seeing a temperature of 56 degrees. Winds are pretty light at this point, but coming up in my detailed forecast, David, I'll talk more about the rest of the holiday weekend, plus a little bit of a warm up that's on the way by the early part of next week. All right, pushing the backyard barbecue back a day <laughs> right. or two. Thank you, Joe. To the Oregon primary, an update on the ballot blunder in Clackamas County. Officials still need to transfer about 35,000 faulty ballots by hand. It's a process that requires teams to work in pairs and one that is likely to slow down over the holiday weekend. But glass half full here, the county still thinks they are going to get it done by next Thursday. Clackamas County has tallied and reported about 70% of 116,000 ballots. Both the county and Secretary of State's office turned down interview requests today. As it stands, they are targeting June 2nd to wrap it up. By law, the election has to be certified by June 13th. And those ballots with misprinted barcodes significantly delayed results in one key race. This one, Oregon's Congressional District 5. But tonight, incumbent Kurt Schrader has conceded. In a statement, he thanked his supporters and congratulated challenger Jamie McLeod Skinner. Schrader has served in Congress for 14 years, is the first member of Oregon's congressional delegation to lose a primary in over 40 years. Now, McLeod Skinner will face Republican Lori Chavez de Reamer, the former mayor of Happy Valley, in November. I come to work every day and I'm scared for my life. Scared for her life, that is what some businesses say it has come to along one stretch of Northwest 23rd. Break-ins, vandalism, and fear week after week. Our Blair Best talked to some shop owners in Northwest Portland who are growing more frustrated not only by these attacks on their livelihoods, but also the police response. I never thought it would get to this. Broken windows. A street cone through the window. You can still see broken glass, you know. Glass all over right here. Graffiti. The new graffiti, either last night or the night before, right there on our awning, 
I'm not sure how to clean that off yet. Common occurrences for restaurant owner Walter Bowers. It's a significant hardship, you know, it, it really is when it happens at the frequency that it happens. He's run Ty Bloom for eight years and says the vandalism has never been this bad. It's just frustrating and, and it's to, to a point it's just a, it's boiling over. It's, it's killing me. This is, this is a one person shop. Last week, nearly $13,000 worth of merchandise was stolen from Ford Gray. The owner caught it on camera. Put a blanket, a very expensive blanket over her arm, grabbed a bunch of stuff in her hands, put them in her like kangaroo pocket, um, and then took all of our gold jewelry. She called police and was on hold for 30 minutes. We know there's no help coming. <laughs> Down the street at Arcteryx, gates now cover the front doors. Behind me here, this window has graffiti etched into it. That was the newest of the new, and that window alone is going to be $3,000. Store manager Emily Ballas just hired these two security guards, costing $7,500 a week. Video from earlier this month shows a man walk into the store with a knife. He later threatens an employee with it. It's just like, when does it stop? I mean, we're updating our security. I have security cameras. I have security guards. Um, you know, I'm getting a panic button installed. Um, I don't know what to do. We are as frustrated as anyone. Sergeant Allen at the Portland Police Bureau says they don't have enough staff to cover low priority calls, such as property theft and vandalism. And it takes an officer sometimes hours to respond. And you have to explain, hey, the reason I couldn't get here is because we had a homicide uh, and I was stuck on that homicide for the last four hours. We only have so many resources. We have to prioritize what we can take care of first. And every time our first priority is going to be life safety. So a lot of these business owners have been told to file police reports works so they've done that yeah. and then they call in to, to follow up and they're being told that these police reports aren't being read because they're understaffed. A lot of reports get written and uh, get put in our system but I want to make it clear that that doesn't mean that nothing ever happens. Sometimes uh, follow-up is not done because we don't have the staffing absolutely but sometimes it does. I feel helpless we can't do anything. Understandable. Blair Best reporting there and police encourage people to continue filing police reports because they say it helps them solve repeat crimes. Still ahead, the most